Welcome to AIDS 2020 Virtual. In this session, we will be discussing the issues and the challenges that we as transgender women have faced to be in leadership positions. We have with us Alexandra de Ruiz. Alexandra is from Mexico. She is a published author in Spain, the US and Mexico. She did her studies in the US. She studied psychology and specialized in sex and gender study. She is the co-founder of El La Para Trans Latina, an empowerment program for transgender Latinas in San Francisco, California. Michelle Ross, founder of Clinic Q, executive director, well-being and development. She has been involved with HIV and sexual health for 32 years. She is a member of Public Health England, CAB, and of the PrEP Impact Trial and conveners of Clinic 6 conferences. Michelle is a member of the IRGT board. And now, finally, we have with us Victoria. I don't want to do you injustice by presenting you. Please go ahead. My name is Victoria Gigante. I'm originally from the Philippines and now living here in the United Kingdom. I'm currently working for an NHS trust here in the uh, United Kingdom in London. And I am also one of the members of the Stonewall Transgender Advisory Group lobbying and campaigning for transgender equality here in the United Kingdom. And at the same time, I'm also working and um, collaborating with Clinic Q. So thank you and welcome everybody. Uh, so let's start with you, Victoria. Can you please tell us about your experience as a trans activist and a leader in the community? The journey for me being a trans activist is quite very tricky and complicated at some point because Obviously, I feel like sometimes I am fighting alone. As you know, at this time, the struggle is really real when we can see um, trans people of color, particularly had been, uh, being attacked, being killed, and, and across the world is something like discriminated for who they are. And for me, coming here into a foreign country, something like um, at the beginning is something like I've struggled a lot, but as, you have, as what you've said, we're very resilient and we're very persevering to, to achieve what we can achieve. And to the fact that there are so many trans activists and group and organization out there that are willing to help us. And that is why I got involved to different um, charity organizations like Clinic Q. And um, it's really amazing to have this camaraderie and unity within our community. So we feel not to just fight alone but fighting together there's different ways of being an activist and every ways is valid you can be an activist for your own selves as an individual or you can be an activist as part of the group and no matter what you choose on those areas your visibility is very important and i think as long as you just keep on going and keep on, you know, pushing that our identity, our existence is, is a human right and trans rights are, are human rights. So let's just keep on going. Thank you, Victoria. Now we go to Alejandra. Alejandra, you come from Mexico, from Latin America, a region in the world that is known, sadly, for the high rates of trans murders, for the, such a high level of transphobia. We see every day trans women particularly being killed, being abused, uh, being victims of crimes. How do you manage to get that, gather that energy, that essence, to make you a leader in the community. Tell us about your experience and your journey. Like Victoria said, um, it's not an easy task to really place yourself as an um, activist and, and a, a community leader. Um, it is a difficult situation really for us as transgender women of color, especially. And um, to really come to terms with what it means to be an activist or to be a community leader. Uh, for me, it's been not an easy uh, process because I, I got into activism uh, by mere accident because one of my best friends was murdered in San Francisco, California. The uh, portrait of transgender uh, 
uh, women specifically uh, in the media, you know, they portray us as, you know, stereotypes and a stigma. So for me, it was like a, a moral responsibility to respond to that. So I wanted to do something. I wanted to be like um, um, a voice for those that didn't have a voice, like my friend, and tell people, you know, transgender people, we are uh, productive. We are in the world doing things, creating. For me, that's how I came into activism and discovered like how the, the, the fight for our human rights is real and is very, very, uh, it has many, many challenges. Being an activist is really a, a matter of uh, being, put yourself on the line and really advocate and, and represent the community you, you are advocating for. And um, as a community leader, for me, it's difficult to really say, oh, I'm the leader of my community because I'd rather be like the person that uh, is, is at the front lines fighting for our human rights and representing my communities better than being a leader. It's funny that you represent yourself not using the word leader, but you're doing exactly what a leader should do, putting themselves in the front line. So thank you very much for all that you do. Now, Michelle, you know, we go to a place in the world where many people think, oh, it's advanced people there. Like if you ask somebody from Latin America or from Eastern Southern Africa, a trans people, they will say, oh, London must be a paradise to be trans, you know? So... Yeah. Darling, please tell us, what is your experience, you know, in this journey of becoming an activist and a leader? Becoming an activist was kind of by default into my work within HIV, which, as you mentioned, I've been doing for 32 years. And I focused on everybody. I've been a psychotherapist all that time. And my, my focus on everybody who was either impacted or at risk of contracting HIV. And then I realized that my community as trans people were not being focused on, were not being included in HIV prevention and HIV care. And there was no data on trans people in a high income country, which you touched on at all. No data, no services for trans people around sexual health. And I was told many times when I started thinking, actually, we need a space, like something like where people can come and have sexual health, not be judged, have you know, hormone levels testing, have cervical screening for trans men, all those things. I was told by many cis people, you cannot have a service like that just for trans people. It's never going to work. We've tried and they don't come to sexual health services. And I said, well, not your kind of sexual health services they don't come to. <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, you're not coming from a place of knowingness or knowing um, what the community, but it's not just about knowingness. Once we set up clinic here, it's about inviting people in to learn to trust us, that we mm -hmm. are from the community and part of the community. So it took a while to build that trust where there'd never been any kind of service like clinic here in the UK. Um, it took a while. So I got into that kind of trans activism out of that place. And a bit like Alexandra, I struggle with it kind of referring to myself as a leader because I think, I don't know, it's kind of complex. And I think um, there was something that came to mind as I heard Alexandra and, and um, Victoria speaking about London, the UK, is often seen, as you say, Erica, um, as a paradise or a great place for trans people. You know, and a lot of trans people in the UK I think actually it's a struggle. We don't get the things with two, for two or three years. And I, and I knew mm -hmm. it was different in other countries, but until I started meeting and working with people like Alexander and um, Victoria and yourself, I then heard the real stories of other countries, which was very different, with no access at all, or potential mm -hmm. access to sometimes HIV care and no access to gender care. And it made me give a wake up call to myself and I speak about it to other people that you know while we might find it difficult in the UK or some people do that actually think about the wider global issue for trans people and that's what's really important for me and that's why I'm involved with the IOGT which is a global network of trans women responding to the HIV um, in our communities and other you know 
obviously HIV is not just about trans women, it's about trans men and non-binary people too. And that's really important. But um, I think the most impacting within our communities, as you know, have been um, around trans women for many different reasons. So I think about things as being thriving. While things have been a struggle and it's been told I can't do this and I thought, well, watch me, I can. I think about thriving in these difficult times and especially in COVID-19 lockdown. I think it's, it's such a beauty to recognize that in, it doesn't matter which part of the world we live in. We have our own struggles. You know, many times as a community, we like to have the martyrdom scale. We measure like who suffers more. No, yeah. oh, I have it worse than you. And it's like a competition to who, yeah. to who is more mar in a martyrdom scale. Mm -hmm. and, and that's completely unacceptable. You have to get to that position where you don't compare who suffers mm -hmm. more. You yeah. have to get to that position where you understand that every need is valued and weighs the same. So thank you for sharing those different perspectives. And Michelle, I want, want to put you on the spot here and I want you to think about a single moment in your life that was that moment that triggered, that, you know, bam, I'm an activist now. I care, I want to serve people. Is there a single moment in your life when that clicked? You go, yes, it goes back to my beginning in HIV because I knew the, the crisis that was happening in many of my friends dying ill and, and some of those friends were trans women as well, but mostly mm -hmm. cisgender gay men. And um, I knew I had to do something and I didn't know what, but I felt a passion. I felt something to do around HIV and that's how I, I was inspired. And as I say, I didn't know what to do, but I learned a lot of skills through being involved in that. And I developed those skills and I became a psychotherapist, which actually at that time, I didn't know other, any other trans women in the UK that were doing that kind of thing, especially around HIV. And that is still my focus, HIV, but obviously trans people as well, uh, and the wider issues within our community. And I loved what you said, you know, don't compare really, because there's people that live in where they live, that's what they're used to, that's what they expect. So um, we treated the same as any other citizens in their country. But the start um, for trans activism was very much realizing that there needed to be a change in the UK around sexual health and HIV for trans people. And the first person I got in touch with was Walter Brockton. He'd done an article on trans women with HIV oh, quite a few years ago. And he spoke about Joanne Keatley. And I got in touch with Joanne Keatley. And that's how I got involved with more research and activism. And I produced the first sexual health and wellbeing booklets in the UK with Terence Higgins Trust. But there was no funding for it. That's amazing. That's amazing. It's amazing how small the world is for our community. Mm -hmm. We know each other in the world and how little funding there is. But I want each one of you to share with our audience today one struggle. What was the main struggle that you faced in your part to path towards activism? And how did you deal with it? Living here in the United Kingdom, when I got here, I was alone. I don't have my family support. I'm originally from the Philippines, with a very conservative country where mainly 80% of the Filipinos are Catholic, very conservative. There are so many LGB and trans people out there, but there's still no legal um, protection and laws that will uh, protect and um, secure our uh, human rights there in the Philippines. Um, at the moment, there's, um, we're pushing forward the uh, SOGI bills, uh, sexual orientation, gender identities, um, and expression bills, which had been pending for almost 20 years now. And um, it's real struggle, really, for the LGBT Filipinos out there. It's good that we discuss not to compare from certain countries to certain countries because every different place has a different unique aspect on how they will really fight towards human rights. One of the struggles that I really faced was my family support it was not here. And I struggled a lot as well during during this time when I got here, I was also transitioning. I complete, I'm trying to transition here in United Kingdom. And um, 
facing all this discrimination at work and into the wider society is really kind of giving me a lot of physical and emotional hardship. But it's good to learn on how you can manage to self-care. I think of my family, the ultimate reason of why I got here in this country is to provide them a good future, not only for them, but also for myself. And by the way, just for give you another, another information is back then in the Philippines, I already transitioning, but obviously they don't have this kind of awareness of what is the transgender people. Yeah. So I stopped the transitioning there. And when I got here in United Kingdom 2009, that's when I decided to transition. And I can see that there's more wider support within the community. And as what you've mentioned, how did I manage the self-care? Um, just thinking of how I really look after myself, self-love, self-care. And it's really important as well to emphasize that we really don't need to compare ourselves to other people. But I think it's important to compare ourselves to our old selves on how we were trying to achieve more towards what we really desire. And again, life is a, life is a journey. And as long as you enjoy the journey, no matter how painful it is, it will be lighting up, you know. Um, yes, I'm thinking be optimistic in life and obviously surround yourself with so many supportive and of you know positive people out there who are really accept and knows your uh, human rights. So um, that is one of the one of the ways that I overcome all of these challenges. We need to accept ourselves and not everything can be color rose, you know. It, mm -hmm. Like it says, every rose has its storms and we need to like it, the whole thing. So Michelle, tell us, um, can you tell us one main challenge in your path and how did you overcome it? So when I mentioned earlier about having no data uh, for trans people accessing HIV, living with HIV in, in the UK, um, we have it now because um, Public Health England is the, organizer, is the um, place where all the data goes to around all kind of like sexually transmitted infections, HIV. So I knew the person who was head of HIV, um, no, HIV, uh, Public Health England rather. And so I went, I, I had a meeting with her. So I said to her, look, this can't go on. Something's got to change. And they're the ones that record, tell sexual health services how to record data. Well, at Clinic Q, we'd use the two-state data collection, which I know the uh, Centre of Trans Health in, in San Francisco, John Keatley, put in place many years ago. Mm -hmm. So we used that and adapted it. And then I showed them. So I went with a plan. I said, this is what you can do. Look what we've done, how we've collected data, and you can do this. So from that meeting, we invited other trans people from different organisations to come and say, let's see how this works. And now, from 2016, we have data which we can build on of trans and people more. with HIV. Because as you all know so well, without data, we are invisible to, to health, to yeah. HIV, and to That's all true. health, really. And um, so we built up on that. And also, when PrEP came in, the PrEP trial in, the U in England, um, I was determined that that was inclusive of trans people. So I mm. got on board with that. I was an activist in PrEP availability in the UK before it was available. And um, I'm still on that advisory board. And, and now it's going to be rolled out from a trial across England um, mm. for anyone who needs it. But still, there's something I need to do. There's no data on sexually transmitted infection of trans people in the whole of the UK. There's HIV now, but there's no data on STIs. So mm -hmm. that is a challenge to still get that done. And we will. If I see a problem, go with a plan. So yes, I can, I can clearly see that you don't shy away from a challenge. You know, you, that's what, where you get your energy. Alejandra, can you uh, tell us, you know, 
What has been one of the main challenges that you have faced and how did you overcome it? Right now, with, the, with this pandemic that we are going through uh, globally, and it reminds me a lot when the AIDS pandemic uh, started, although we are talking uh, 30 something years ago yeah. and we've been through a change of a century, you know, that was in the 20th century, we're in the 21st century now. Um, I feel that for, uh, for us transgender people, um, we still seeing and discovering the social economical um, inequality that exists in, in a cis uh, heteropatriarchal society because mm -hmm. trans rights are not the same as the rest of the cis populations. Um, for me, I believe uh, finding dignified uh, health care and opportunities for, uh, for uh, dignified uh, work uh, have been a challenge in, uh, in a society that tells us that we are not good enough and we don't have what it takes to really uh, make it in, in, in this uh, society. Um, so I believe that it has been um, really a, a struggle, uh, especially since I've uh, been back to, to my own country, you know. Mm -hmm. um, I've been here almost nine years and I have never had a job until this year. So almost eight years that I've been struggling and um, I'm glad that Michelle mentioned uh, jo Joanne Kidley because um, she, she is what a leader should be. Always helping others and, and making sure that our communities are going forward uh, in a society what I'm trying to get into is that if it wasn't for the international work that I've been doing all these years since I've been back to, to Mexico, uh, I probably wouldn't be here. I probably would have to go back to the U.S. or to another place to survive, you know, and um, or find other meanings to survive in my own country other than the work that has become my passion which is the fight for our human rights, for transhuman rights, migrants' rights, um, human rights. Um, and uh, so I feel that due to this new era uh, that we're going into, um, it, may be, it maybe makes us uh, stronger. And um, as we know, as trans sisters, our resilience it's what it made us, and, and really, for some reason, uh, I don't know how we do it, but we find a way, and I think we are making way right now by sharing this space and these experiences. So uh, for me, I think that's the solution, to keep united, to keep fighting together against this society, they see us, uh, transgender people, as uh, disposable. Yes, and you know, like it's, it's, it's time flies when we're having such good conversations. So yeah. you know, we're gonna have to start to round up, but I want you, all of you to answer me two questions really fast. So I want to hear from you, uh, Alejandra, first. So what would you put in place or what needs to be, in pla put, be put in place so that the youth, the transgender youth don't have to go to those challenges anymore? I feel that we have to uh, be an example and also to let them lead the way as well because we cannot take it upon ourselves. We already done a lot of work through our lives and we already know the struggle. So to make it easier for them is to say, look, this is how you do it. This is the way. There you go. Because if we keep trying to be the ones 
at the front and saying, oh, I am, I am the elder, I am the leader, I am this. Um, are, are you really had to get to do it? So I think it's really important to know that. And, 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 and to me, it's really important to have the youth uh, nowadays leading the way for the new generations. Because as we know, there's uh, ch trans children already. And, and that makes me really happy because when I was a child, I wish there would have been somebody that would tell me, it's okay to feel and, be, and, and to want to be who you want to be. That's what can I say. I love what Alessandra just said then. And absolutely, you know, some people say to me, oh, you're one of the people whose shoulders we stand on. And I say, standing on people's shoulders, you see that much further. And we're here to support you see that much further. So it's about, for me, giving that space and stepping back. And, you know, knowing that I've done what I've done, but also other people need to do more and they can do that. And I'm happy to support people and give up my place at the table, which I maybe have created along with other trans women, that they need to have that because they are the future. I'm 71 this year. I'm not the future. They are our future and their future. And that's mm -hmm. really important for me. And also, if we put in place any services for trans people, they can do it more. They can take it further. They can get employment, yeah. though we never did when I was younger. That's what Michelle and Alexandra said. Um, I agreed totally with them. And um, there's no really a universal way of transitioning. Mm -hmm. And you can transition at young age, at a later age. And the best, I think, for what we can put in place as an activist is to really support the organizations that are already out there and really empowering our community and make it more have this awareness about what are the services that they are offering and let this um, all this charity organization out protecting our existence um, to be put out in there for the government to, to be aware of. So they know to signpost some transgender people to those certain organization and then we really, the certain charity can really guide them. And I think, um, yeah, those are the things that we can put in place in an activist to other people who are transitioning at the, at the very early stage you know, uh, we wouldn't be struggling anymore. And um, yeah, that's what I think one of the ways that we can do. Thank you very much. So I will ask you, Victoria, if you had a full audience of LGBTQI persons right in front of you, what is one message you would tell them? Happy Pride Month. Be brave. Be who you are, because no matter who, how you present yourself, your existence is valid. And knowing your rights is very important as well, so we can, you can protect yourselves. And that's one of the messages that I can do, just enjoy and be visible out there. Thank you very much. Alessandra, what message would you have for transgender youth? That's okay for them to be who they want to be. And I will, uh, that I'm here supporting their work and uh, cheering them up. And um, I, will, I will say uh, to the rest of the um, uh, LGBTQI uh, people to invest in us, invest in trans people. Mm -hmm. It is worth it. And Michelle, if you have a room full of donors, the people with the money and the fact check books, what <laughs> would you tell them? I say, give it to me now. No, but <laughs> invest in trans people because trans people can do this. And knowing that, that trans people are professionals, we're not just like trans people there, and many of us fought tooth and nail to get where we are. And so by, by investing and funding in trans people, it makes it better for younger trans people to mm -hmm. take forward, to develop, and to be employed. Trans people are often expected to do things for nothing. Well, trans people need to feed, they need to clothe, they need money to live. To everybody, we are transgender women. There's three amazing leaders, resilient, powerful transgender women in this panel, and we're here to stay. So thank you very much for listening to us. With us, we have 
Michelle, Alessandra, Victoria, and your host, Erika Castellanos. Goodbye, everybody. Enjoy AIDS 2020.